Well, two more, more than two years after the Capitol breach, prosecutors have charged over a thousand people in relation to January 6. The defendants are from all over the country, all different ages, races, backgrounds. That also includes Stacy Lynn Stevens, an elderly grandmother. She was arrested for walking around inside the Capitol and discovered afterwards on social media by an FBI informant whose job is to scour the internet for January 6 trespassers, nonviolent offenders. The grandma is now facing misdemeanors, but probably more severe treatments than somebody like Sam Bankman Free. Joining us now to talk about this is senior contributor for American Greatness, Julie Kelly. Great to see you, Julie. Hey guys, how are you? Thanks for having me on. Well, as I mentioned, Sam Bankman Freed, he's living not a bad life now at his parents' house in Palo Alto, California. What about this grandma? Is she going to be treated like some of the other January 6 defendants and locked away thrown and the key thrown away to forget about forever? I don't know about the key being thrown away, but her life will be destroyed. There's no doubt about that. Uh, this is what's happening to the now thousand plus criminal defendants, most of whom, like this woman here, face low level misdemeanors like trespassing. Um, and so what's amazing, uh, John, is that there was a Washington Post article today talking about the violent crime wave in Washington, D.C. Mm. And the, the prosecutor there, Matthew Graves, the D.C. U.S. attorney, uh, whose office by far uh, has the highest percentage of declination uh, rates. So this means prosecutors decline, declining to prosecute whoever investigators bring to them, police especially, uh, uh, criminals in, that, in the city of Washington, D.C. At the same time, this is what Matthew Graves and his prosecutors are doing, continuing to investigate, charge and prosecute uh, trespassers, basically, from a four-hour event that ended 26-plus months ago. This is a political persecution. It is a wave of our own type of terror um, because what it wants to, what this is doing quite effectively is criminalizing uh, political dissent in, in this country. Yes, and for all the people who showed up on January 6th and did not go in the Capitol, did not participate in the violence that day, those are the people that they want to get this message out to so they don't show up the next time and peacefully and patriotically make their voices heard. Julie, let's also focus on the, tri uh, the Proud Boys trial. The defense team is choosing not to call a witness after learning that she was an informant for the FBI. The judge in this case deciding that her history could not be raised. I, I know how closely you've been covering this. One of the things that's astounding to me is how many confidential informants were apparently inside the Proud Boys. It seems like there were more people working for the FBI than actually working for the Proud Boys. It's starting to look like the Whitmer fednapping hoax, John. You recall that when yep. there were more, uh, far more FBI informants and undercover agents than there were criminal defendants. That's what it's looking like in this Proud Boy trial. Uh, in fact, it's sort of become a punchline. One of the public defenders representing a defendant last week in court told the judge, she said, I want to go on record. Uh, I am not now, nor have I ever been, a CHS, which is the acronym for Informant Confidential hmm. Human Source. So it's kind of becoming a joke. There's another FBI informant on the stand today talking about being with the Proud Boys during the first breach, entering the building. Um, apparently, he was authorized by the FBI to commit some low-level crimes so he could look like he was one of the Proud Boys. Um, so this trial is really unfolding and, and raising a lot of questions, John, uh, about exactly what the FBI did, how many uh, undercover agents or inform informants were involved, and why prosecutors are waiting until the last minute to disclose this growing number of informants uh, in this group. Also, Julie, before we wrap up here, tell us a little bit more about George Tanio, someone else you've been covering. Right. So there's an interview up uh, with Steve Baker, with uh, George Tanio. So I've covered his case since his arrest in March 2021. Basically, what they did is destroy this man to keep alive the narrative the Capitol Police officer Brian Sicknick was killed by Trump supporters on January 6. George Tanios refused to take a plea deal. The government finally dropped assault charges against him. He pleaded guilty to two misdemeanors, but he spent five months in the D.C. Gulag, John, before his pretrial detention order mm. was overturned. He's lost his business. He's bankrupted. And now he's being sued for $10 million, a wrongful death suit by Sicknick's ex-girlfriend. I'm, I'm speechless. I, you know, where... What happened to due process? What happened to justice in this country? It's eroding before our very eyes in a lot of these cases. Thank you, Julie, for covering them and keeping me abreast of everything that's going on. You do a great job, and I'm always honored to talk to you. Same here, John. Thanks for having me on. Take care.